defeat of Germany in World War II was only achieved by the close cooperation of the Allies and the immense effort and sacrifice of countless men and women from many nations. The uprooting of American servicemen from their homes and their transfer to new bases in England enabled them to play a prime part in the war effort. One such group was the 306th Bombardment Group of the 8th Air Force. They arrived at Thurlai Airfield near Bedford in the autumn of 1942. This is the story of their return exactly 50 years later. During the period that the group occupied the airfield, many thousands of men passed through the site, as many as 2,500 at any one time. Today, nearly 400 people returned to Thurlai from America to remember and pay homage to the comrades who didn't return from the 341 missions that left the runways here between 1942 and 1945. The upheaval accompanying the arrival of such a huge influx of young Americans is well remembered by the local population with affection and respect. Many of them attend the ceremonies of today to remember and to meet old friends from so long ago. The memorial was erected here close to the last remaining wartime accommodation on the 40th anniversary reunion in 1982. It forms the setting for today's memorial service. ages, men have attempted and succeeded in this task. And with man's conquest of the skies, a new dimension has been added to his knowledge and his abilities. But not only has he flown to enlarge the borders of his understanding, but to defend the land of his birth. So we come today to bring our, to our remembrance those who, with great courage and careless thought for themselves, have laid down their lives for their homelands. Oh, 
Mr. Mayor, Lady Mayoress, High Sheriff and Mrs. James, Sir Trevor and Lady Skeet, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ralph Franklin and I have the privilege of being British coordinator for the 306 Bombardment Group's 50th anniversary reunion. I suppose like many other areas in England, North Bedfordshire had changed very little during the late 30s and the early 40s. Certainly by the time 1942 arrived, we had been at war for over two years. Most of the young men in the area had been conscripted and the Germans had attempted to disorganise the community by their incessant bombing. But life went on very much the same until September. Then it happened. Suddenly they were here. The 306 had arrived. They looked good in their smart uniforms. They were cheerful, chappy and carefree. They didn't really want to be here. Their hearts were not with us. They were back home in Philadelphia, Tennessee, Boston. However, they were here to do a job, and what a wonderful job they did. That was 50 years ago, a very long time in anyone's life. But many of the friendships that began in those dark days of World War II have been strengthened by the passage of time. It is a great pride, therefore, that on this very special occasion, I can once again extend the hand of friendship and welcome back to the now peaceful countryside of North Bedfordshire, this time many of them with their wives and families, the men of the 306 Bombardment Group. A heartfelt welcome to you all. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Donald Ross, President of the 306 Bomb Group Association. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests all. Welcome, one and all, to this memorial service on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the arrival of Thurlai at the 306th Bob Group. This morning, we will first have remarks from the current vice commander of the 3rd Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present for our first speech this morning, Colonel Robert L. Frost. Thank you and good morning. It's a privilege to be here. The Apostle Paul has an image in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12. Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I believe that today, Right now, here, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses as we gather in Thurlai for this event. Surely, this crowd consists of more than we live human persons. We're here to celebrate the willingness of men and women to throw off everything that hinders, to wholeheartedly run a race, to embrace a significant cause. In this specific case, of course, we focus on the 306 Bombardment Group and their willingness to defend freedom against a tyrannical and fanatic enemy. The achievements of the 306th during the war have placed its name in the history books. During the time it was based at Thurlai, a great many men and a great many machines played their part in the huge effort to repel the threat of invasion and to secure eventual victory. There were features unique to this place and the men of the 306 Bombardment Group. The base became the first place in England to be turned over to American control completely, giving them full sovereignty and control of these few acres. The 306 stayed longer than any other 8th Air Force combat unit at a single base. It stayed longer in England than any other 8th Air Force bomber or fighter unit. And it was the only unit to use only a single base from the beginning to the end of the war. Many records and honors were obtained by the 306. In January 1943, the 306 bomb group led the first raid on German soil by the 8th Air Force and hence earned itself the motto, first over Germany. 
The Luftwaffe was not prepared for the squadrons of B-17s and the Germans' initial ability to defend themselves was limited. In those early days, there were few losses. But it wasn't long before they were better able to deal with the daylight raids over Germany. Thanks to their robust construction, B-17s were able to take a lot of damage and many were able to limp home to be repaired and fly again. Others were not so fortunate. In total, throughout the three-year period, 171 aircraft went missing in action. casualties increased, there was a welcome boost to morale with the award to Sergeant Maynard Snuffy Smith of the Medal of Honor, equivalent to a British Victoria Cross, the first such award made to a World War II airman. Smith, the gunner, saved his aircraft and crew when under attack from fighters and with potentially disastrous fires in the radio room and rear fuselage. Without regard for his own personal safety, he left his position in the ball turret, extinguished the fires, severely burning himself in the process, fought off Messerschmitts, shuttling between gun positions, and tended to the wounds of his injured colleagues. The B-17 reached Cornwall, but never flew again. The crew survived, except for three who bailed out over the channel, believing the aircraft was doomed. Sergeant Smith? The medal was presented to Smith by the US Secretary of State for War, Henry Stimson, on 15th July 1943. It was almost unprecedented for such a presentation to be made outside the USA and by anyone other than the President himself. Good publicity resulted from Stimson's visit to the European Theatre for the purpose of the award. The benefit to the morale of the group after this award was tangible, and other exercises of a similar nature continued throughout the war. The King and Queen visited Thurlai in November 1942, believed to be the first such visit to any US Air Force base. They came again on 6th of July 1944, and this time brought with them Princess Elizabeth, who christened a B-17, Rose of York. Originally, this aircraft had been named the Princess, then Princess Elizabeth, but it was felt that the latter name could give rise to damaging propaganda in the event of the aircraft's loss on operations. The name Rose of York was chosen by the aircraft's maintenance crew chief, Sergeant Ed Gregory, who's also believed to have made the suggestion that the princess be invited to christen her. To everyone's surprise, she accepted. Sadly, Rose of York was lost during February 1945. During the time the 306 were at Thurlai, 341 missions were completed. Even today, 50 years later, the effect that these traumatic experiences had on the participants is still apparent. Today those planes we saw go down, go down, the friends who never came home, the men who spent much of the war in prison camps, those whose wounds ended their combat flying, and those who found their experiences unnerving at best. As for me, 48 years have passed all too rapidly. On this exact date in 1944, we flew an interesting mission to the Gelsenkirchen in the Ruhr Valley. It was an unforgettable day for some as the 368th lost a crew with whom my crew had gone through stateside training. It always hurt a little more when the crew going down was someone you knew personally. And I figured out later on that I didn't really know many people, particularly the other squadrons. And this became, this was a form of protection. In the early days of this group, almost everyone knew almost everyone else. And it was a terrible experience to lose an aircraft. Quoting Thurman Schuller again, he said, losing an aircraft was bad enough. The worst thing that happened was 
<coughs> when they brought home the bodies in the flames. And he said that, <coughs> that tore up everyone. The medics, the ground crews, and all felt it very distinctly. I think I speak for many here today when I say we are proud to have had a chance to play a role in one of history's major events and then to live for many years in a world which we helped create. Perhaps our only wish today is that 50 or 100 years from now, some residents of Bedfordshire will wish to gather here with a small group of our descendants to once again affirm that we defeated the enemy and are retired from the field with honor. Thank you.
occasion was marked by a display of both flying and static aircraft. Many period aircraft were on show, most of them maintained in flying condition. and despite the weather put on a wonderful display of precision formation flying. The Defence Research Agency, which is now based at Thurlai, operates many planes for defence and development purposes. The tornado was developed jointly by the British, German and Italians and played an important part in the Gulf War. The Buccaneer, which is used by the Navy, And the Hawk, flown by the Red Arrows, is a high-performance trainer, bought by many air forces including the US Marines. This BAC-111 was developed as a civil airliner, but is used by the DRA as a research flying test bed. Accompanied by a Harrier jump jet, these aircraft joined up for a fly past. As did these helicopters, a Sea King, a Wessex and a Gazelle, also operated by the DRA for research purposes. gave a show of its special abilities. Its movable nozzles give it the ability to hover and also to take off and land vertically. Much of the research work on prototypes for this aircraft was carried out here. Now adopted by the US Marines, the Harrier has seen service throughout the world.
B-51D Mustang, conceived and designed to a British requirement by North American Aviation. The Merlin engine was built under license by Packard and made the fighter ideal as an escort for long-range bombers, thanks to its long endurance, a result of efficient aerodynamics, low fuel consumption and a large fuel capacity. This particular Spitfire served in 1940 squadron of the Royal Air Force. It was one of the RAF fighters that escorted the 306th on the day they flew their first mission on the 9th of October 1942. It is now owned by the Shuttleworth Trust who've restored it to flying condition after it had been used as an instructional airframe at Loughborough College of Technology. The last flying Mosquito in Britain was one of the last to serve with the RAF. Developed originally as an unarmed bomber, its unusual wooden construction meant it could carry the same bomb load as a B-17. Later it was used as a day and night fighter after being fitted with guns, as a photo reconnaissance plane and also as a trainer. This particular plane was used in the film 633 Squadron, from which it still bears a fictitious serial number. It's now operated as a display aircraft by British Aerospace from Woodford Airfield in Cheshire. pilot whose aircraft is based on a landing strip close to Thurlai. The star of the show though was the B-17 which appeared through the rain to bring a thrill to the expectant crowd. This aircraft was built in 1945. The experts among you will know that this makes the plane a B-17G which is distinguished by the chin turret but it's finished in the colours of an early F model which were added when it starred in the movie Memphis Belle. The B-17 has a wingspan of 103 feet. It's powered by four Wright Cyclone engines, has a crew of 10, is armed with 13 half-inch Browning machine guns and is capable of carrying a 6,000-pound bomb load. Over 12,000 were built. 
This particular aircraft was used originally by the USAF for training and other purposes and was later sold to the French Geographical Society for photo mapping work. In 1976 it came to Duxford and is now operated by B-17 Preservation Limited as a flying memorial to the men of the 8th Air Force. The chequered engine cowling is in memory of Ted White, the original importer, who lost his life in a flying accident a few years ago. group and their guests, many now in period uniforms and dress, regrouped in the evening in one of the original hangars, now moved to the north side of the airfield. Cleared of a fleet of research Canberra aircraft, the hangar was set out as a giant dance floor, with a stage and a bar, and scores of tables for the hundreds of guests. This was the hangar in which the Glenn Miller Band performed on 15th July 1944 their very first concert on an airfield in the European theatre. Appropriately, the band was the Herb Miller Orchestra. Herb, now alas departed, was Glenn's brother, and the band is now led by his son John, Glenn's nephew. The band enters in period military vehicles, wearing period uniforms, and playing and singing the nostalgic music of the era.
brand new job Makes you glad to be alive It's a modern therapy Come and do Herbie's Jive with me Herbie's Jive All the kids are doing Herbie's Jive Moms and dads are doing Herbie's Jive Even you can do it Won't you do it too Won't you do it too Won't you do it Herbie's Jive All my friends playing Herbie's Jive All the people playing Herbie's Jive members of the 306, we owe so much, but they will not be forgotten. 